morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce Aaron Batista. He um, actually got two undergrad degrees, um, one in philosophy, as well as computer science and engineering. And then he got, and that was from University of Pennsylvania, yep, where he also got a computer and information science master's. And then he went to work in Richard Anderson's lab at Caltech, um, doing all kinds of cognitive BCI kind of stuff. Not, BCI not, not BCI yet at that point. Um, and after that, he went and worked with Bill Newsom and then Krishna Shanoi for postdocs at uh, Stanford. And now he has, in 2007, he moved to University of Pittsburgh and is now Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering there, even though he's kind of the neuroscience bent of that, and is a member of the Center for Neural Basis of Cognition. He's got wonderful lists of publications, as well as recently in this past year, three new R01s that he's PI or co-PI on, and, uh, or dual PI on, and anyway, he's very, very well <laughs> on, on a roll, and we're gonna see all the exciting stuff he's been doing. So, welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Tom, thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. So if the note of suddenly three R01s, that's following a year of very tight funding. So, um, if there are any junior faculty in the room, don't just worry about tenure and think about what that. Thank you, you're gonna have to tenure, because you can end up in kind of a so, luckily recovered from it, and now things are rolling. We have three separate projects going in the lab. I'm gonna tell you about one main story funded by one of these three grants. And at the end, I wanna mention the other, oh, am I not turned on? I, is this on? I don't think so. All right, come on up. Just a little toggle on top. A little toggle, there we go. Oh. I should be up, there we go. I'm on now, I think, right? Yeah, oh, booming. Turn me down. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you about one main project uh, and I will mention at the end the two other projects because for people practically developing BCIs, I think that those projects uh, have some important lessons to, to offer. So um, it's really especially great to be here among kindred spirits and even more than I realized uh, as I went through the day yesterday. So. I added in some slides. It's going to get a little kind of unpolished at the end, but um, if you have to leave at any time, that's totally fine. We'll see how much we get through. Okay, so uh, where does my lab sit? I, I don't know if I'm more like this or more like this. Is it more like brain-computer interfaces as a basic science tool? Or is it more like what can we learn using a primate model that can inform the translation of clinical BCIs? So, I will try to go through this spectrum and tell you about a few stories um, that span this gamut. Interrupt me and ask if you have any questions, please. Okay, so first of all, let me try to motivate where I'm coming from, what drives the type of research that I do. I started off as a philosopher, as Don pointed out, and um, this was well before BCIs were even on the horizon. So. The types of questions that interested me as an undergraduate and an early uh, neuroscience graduate student, what's the neural basis of planning and volition? What's the neural basis of cognition? So think about a guy playing chess. What is he trying to do? So he's sitting here, he's thinking about, he's thinking several moves ahead. He's looking at the situation on the board, running different scenarios through his mind, trying to put a cost-benefit analysis on the outcome of those scenarios. He's also thinking about his opponent and what type of strategy his opponent might have. Um, is this gonna be an aggressive player, a conservative player? Is he showing me his true strategy or will he change his strategy based on mine? All that is going through his mind. And his motor report is this. So what do you wanna study? Do you wanna study this? Or do you wanna study all that cogitation and rumination? How on earth can we use an animal model electrophysiology to get at those internal processes. What's the neural basis of motor skill? How come she can do this and I can't, especially not at 8.30 in the morning, but not ever, okay? Even if I started now, it's kind of too late for me. I'm, I'm not doing this. Um, 
But you know, we come with the same hardware, so what's the difference in the, the how has training changed her neural circuitry to enable that? And for me, it's, uh, it's game over, okay? Moment of insight. So does anyone know who this is? Jackson Pollock, right? So he was a mediocre landscape painter until this happened. And now his paintings cost hundreds of millions of dollars and hang in every museum. What's the difference in his brain before and after he decided to do that? Okay. Can we get answers to these questions? Can we understand skill learning? Can we understand a moment of insight? Can we understand deliberation, cognition? And if we're going to reduce those interesting cognitive phenomena to something that we can actually measure externally, um, my preferred measurement is the action potentials of the brain. Other people might plug in MRI signals or EEG signals, but for me, um, I feel like I understand something if I can see patterns of action potentials that are tightly correlated with the uh, high-level phenomena. Okay. End of philosophy, moving on to some actual neurobiology. My uh, preferred model is the rhesus monkey. And the reason for this is because these guys are closer in terms of cognitive capacity to what we can do, okay? This is a list that I kind of just ran through of what are my colleagues in the field working on. These are cool things to want to try to understand, and they're tractable with one of these animals. She is manipulating a piece of corn to eat it, and she's also communicating socially with you, telling you to back off, this is her corn. There's a lot going on inside this animal's brain and mind. We can access it with electrodes, okay? And for me, that provides a distinct advantage to both human studies, where the accessibility is limited, and rodent studies, where the behavior, although they're creeping up on us very quickly, where the behavior may be more limited. So I always think that primates are going to provide a really important bridge between um, the types of invasive things we can do with a rodent and the types of things that we as humans care about understanding the neural basis of. Of course, it's a leap of faith to imagine that my monkeys with their action potentials can tell me anything about the things that I really care about, okay? We gotta start somewhere. Let's see if we can build that bridge. So brain-computer interfaces. Everybody, who, who knows what a brain-computer interface is? Do we have, okay, yeah, all right. He's like, does he know where he, they're like, does he know where he is? Of course we know what they are. All right, <laughs> so multi-electrode array, this is a black rock array, 100 electrodes, goes into primary motor cortex. Uh, you can take out the activity. For almost everything I'll describe, we're looking at threshold crossings, which is aggregate action potentials from multiple electrodes, multiple neurons near the tip of a single electrode, okay? In the old days, we used to isolate single neurons. I just want the purists to know that we're not doing that. We can think about how much that matters, but keep it in mind, okay? so. The each tick you see here is the time of a threshold crossing, which is roughly an action potential from an aggregate, one or more in an aggregate of neurons, okay? You send it through a BCI decode algorithm to render the movement of a cursor on a computer screen. The animal sees the cursor move. He adjusts his neural activity to try to nudge the cursor toward a goal. That's a BCI, okay? We think, of course, they have wonderful clinical potential. That's why they're being developed. We see great potential for basic neuroscience research as well, okay? So what are the advantages of using a BCI if what you fundamentally care about is basic cognition, sensory motor processing? Well, in the context of a BCI, all the neurons that directly drive behavior are observed by construction. The only neurons that can control the movement of the effector, the behavior in this case, is the activity of those neurons, okay? So we're not gonna miss the action. The decoder is something we've designed. We can complain about, Don and I were complaining about the fact that decoders in general are too simple for the types of things that we really want to enable uh, paralyzed individuals to be able to do, okay? But the truth is these devices are simple, they're under our control, we can adjust their properties to suit our aims, okay? You can't do that with the mapping from the brain to the hand, okay? Who knows what the spinal cord is doing? We control the feedback, we can alter it if we want, okay? And this can all happen 
with the animal's arms at rest at his side so we can decouple the activity of motor cortex or any part of the cortex from movement, which allows us to study the properties of a population of neurons on its own without, you know, kind of separated from its normal function. Okay. So why on earth are these advantages? Suppose that you wanted to understand the neurophysiology of reaching, okay, simple sensory motor coordination of the arm and hand. Okay. People have been working on this for 40 years, including me, and I still do some of this work, but um, what I'm telling you about today focuses on the BCI side of things. So here are the types of questions you want to answer with this paradigm. How do neurons control the effector? Okay. Which neurons matter for behavior? What do all the others contribute? And what drives learning? What drives learning if you make an adjustment to how uh, the animal has to perform his motor task? Okay, now, if you are Peter Strick, then you have all the money, talent, and resources that you need to take your time and solve this problem, okay? But for the rest of us, this problem is too difficult in too many different ways, so we do what all scientists do. We look for a simpler system that has some of the same properties to the system that we ultimately care about, one where we can make progress, and we hope that however the brain controls a BCI bears a strong relationship to how the brain controls natural arm movements. Okay? It'd be weird if the brain had special mechanisms for controlling and learning how to use BCIs. Okay? So we think we're taking very fundamentally interesting problems that are hard to answer and putting them in a Petri dish in a tractable manner, you know, our BCIs are a Petri dish, and hopefully the solutions can be borrowed from how you learn to control a BCI to how you learn to move your arm in natural situations. Okay, so I'm going to talk about learning and uh, something that you guys know, but a lot of people who don't study BCIs are unaware of is that many BCIs, at least the initial ones, BCI studies were actually learning studies. So who knows this study? Eb Fetz's study from 1969. Yeah, the old timers do. Everybody else, go get it and read it. It's wonderful. I read this paper and um, I have a moment of existential dread. What have we done over the last 50 years, really, that improves on this? Someone's laughing. All right, so uh, go read the FETS 1969 paper and feel humbled. Okay. Another fa oh, all the study shows is that animals can learn to upregulate and downregulate the activity of individual neurons and motor cortex. Now we do it with populations of neurons and think we're fancy. Okay, uh, Don Taylor, the, the first BCI study to come out of Andy Schwartz's lab was, I think of it, as a learning study. So they gave the animal a very particular model for a decoder. 45 days later, the animal's neural activity conformed well to that model. That's a very delicate and very magical type of learning. Okay. Uh, building on that, Jose Carmina um, gave animals gave an animal an arbitrary decoder, just, you know, random weights in a matrix that maps neural activity to cursor movement, and he found that over the course of three days, the animal could learn to control that BCI, and he kept that control over the course of another eight days until they began to lose the neurons, okay? So this paper came out, it built directly on these, in my opinion, and uh, it made a strong argument that the brain is wonderfully plastic, that if you give it an arbitrary effector, it can learn how to use it. So that raised in our minds the question, are some BCIs easier to learn to control than others? Seems like there should be some that are easier to learn to control than others, some that are more biomorphic or, or tailored to the particular user, extremely well calibrated. Those should be easy to use right away. Okay, some that are totally perverse, like all the neurons are carefully balanced to cancel each other out. Those you don't have a hope of learning. There's no solution that exists. Okay. But is there, a, is there a spectrum of BCIs that are easier or more difficult to learn? Okay. And can we predict, here's a new BCI decoder, can the animal learn to control it or not? Okay. Okay. Good, these are the people who did the work. Now is when you need to start asking me questions because the main stuff I want to show you is on these next few slides and um, uh, I want it to be clear to everybody so feel free to, I also want it to be you know, solid so if you see something that 
looks like a flagrant problem, call it out, let's talk about it. Okay, so the people who did the work, my theory collaborators, uh, Byron Yu, Byron and I have been working together for almost 20 years now. Uh, he was a grad student when I was a postdoc in Krishna Shinoi's lab. Steve Chase has been working, I don't know if, I guess Steve started after you left Andy Schwartz's lab, but Steve uh, trained with Andy Schwartz and is now faculty at CMU and intensely interested in the same issues we are. So uh, we work together and it's been a wonderfully fruitful interaction. Uh, my students who worked on the first project I'll tell you are here. The students who are working on, the postdocs working on the follow-ups are here. Kristen is now doing human BCI work with Jen Collinger, so if you haven't met her yet, you'll meet her soon, I'm sure. Matt uh, uh, went back to Krishna for his postdoc. He was an undergrad with Krishna, did his PhD with Byron, he's back with Krishna. Jay Hennig, and these well-dressed individuals are our neurosurgeons who implant the arrays. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So the study shows that learning is constrained neurally, okay? By disassociating neural activity from behavior, we're able to show that some of what you can learn can be constrained and predicted by properties of the brain. Okay. Great. So uh, I'm going to make some simplifying assumptions. I need you to remember that all the experiments we actually did involved recording from 90 uh, electrodes, okay, reasonably well isolated threshold crossing multi-unit activity, 90 of them. The cursor moved on a two-dimensional screen in front of the animal, horizontal and vertical. It's hard to think about 90-dimensional spaces, but we do better when we think about three-dimensional spaces. So imagine we're recording from three neurons, and the animal is moving the BCI cursor in just one dimension. Okay? <coughs> it's actually 90 to 2, but all the intuitions that apply here will apply in that case as well. Okay. Ah, yes. So we change, we refer to our decoder as a mapping to capture the geometrical sense of going from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space. And every BCI has a geometrical interpretation. It doesn't matter if it's a Kalman filter, you know, uh, an optimal linear estimator, a population vector algorithm, they can all be thought of as a geometrical projection from one space to another, and you're just talking about um, how that projection is structured. Okay, so if we record the activity of 90 neurons, or just three in this case, you can think of the joint activity across those neurons as a point in that space, okay? For a given 45 millisecond window, you're at one specific point, you just count the number of spikes and that gives you the excursion along each of these axes. So this is just a convenient way to represent the state of that population of neurons at that point in time. Okay? If you have a lot of windows, each separated in time, and you plot the joint activity across the entire population, uh, you can get a cloud of points that looks like this. Um, as long as you run your experiment, you can fill in that cloud. Okay, so you guys, are familiar with this. Uh, there may be people who are not used to thinking about neural populations in this way, so feel free to ask a question. Okay. This is our neural state space. Okay, great. So every BCI session, uh, not session, but uh, every, every time you want to give an animal a new BCI, you need to calibrate that thing. And the way that we calibrate it is simply by having the animal observe the cursor drift to the right or to the left. It seems like drifting a cursor engages the same mechanisms that actually controlling the cursor does. I think the monkey probably thinks he's in control of it and just having a really good day, okay? But in reality, it's under our control. So the cursor drifts, the animal is highly attuned, it's early in the day. He's watching the cursor move to the right. And when he sees it move to the right, you get patterns of neural activity that reside in a particular region of the neural state space. If you drift the cursor to the right six times or divide the trial into six steps, the neural activity patterns tend to be near each other uh, for each of those uh, manipulations. Okay. If you move the cursor to the left, you get a different pattern of neural activity. Okay. Again, for six repeats, they'll be near each other. And in general, they're distinct from the ones that you see when you move the cursor to the right, so it becomes possible to simply fit a line that connects those points. Okay. Uh, we actually use a Kalman filter for anyone who cares, but uh, it can be, it, it has a direct translation into a plane in reality, but I'm showing it as a line in this high dimensional space. So now any neural activity pattern that is over here will project onto this line here 
and move the cursor fast to the right. It's a velocity decoder. Neural activity patterns around here move the cursor slow to the right, and neural activity patterns over here move the cursor fast to the left. Okay? So this rule, this is the BCI decoder, and it gives you a rule to interpret uh, neural activity as cursor velocities. Okay. What happens when you rotate that line? You're requesting different things from the animal now. Neural activity patterns that used to move the cursor to the right now move it to the left. And to move the cursor to the right, the animal has to do something fundamentally different with his neural activity because what he had been doing over here didn't have any impact on the cursor at all. So uh, we like to say that a BCI allows us to request new patterns of neural activity from the monkey. Okay? Can he generate a new pattern of neural activity? The movement of the cursor gives him direct feedback about how well he's doing with that and he can kind of rapidly iterate in a trial to see if he can converge on a solution that gets the cursor to the target. I hope this makes sense. Please stop me if it doesn't or if it seems obscure or, or impenetrable. Okay, so uh, thanks to Byron Yu working with Manish Sahani and Krishna Shinoy. Um, Manish Sahani was present at uh, the very first um, dimensionality reduction applied to neuroscience. He tried to solve this uh, spike sorting problem using uh, PCA for his PhD thesis, and no one had done that yet. So I think of Manish Sahani as one of the people who brought uh, dimensionality reduction into neuroscience. Okay, so there is a uh, clearly low dimensional structure within this neural space, and that's true in all the data that we collect. There are just certain configurations of neural activity that never actually occur. Each neuron on its own can span a, per, span a pretty wide range, okay, but the joint activity of a pair or more neurons just never gets to certain regions. The neurons are correlated, so that's not surprising. What Byron Yu did with Manish and uh, Krishna was to fit low dimensional structures. He used factor analysis, but if you're familiar with PCA, the intuitions are comparable enough that that's good enough. Fit a low dimensional structure to the high dimensional data and realized that with just 10 dimensions for our 90 neurons, we can account for the low dimensional structure that's present in the 90 neuron population. Okay? Um, instead of continuously referring to this as low dimensional structure within a high dimensional space, we just gave it a name, the intrinsic manifold, but it's just meant to capture the idea that there's low dimensional structure. Okay? And it's 10 dimensions, roughly. Some days it's six, some days it's 14. We assume it's 10 and, and run with it from there. Okay, so what is this low dimension? Everyone's doing this now. You have a population of neural recordings. Um, you can either just run a bunch of individual neuron tuning curves on it, or you can reduce the dimensionality and look at structure in the low dimensional space. Lots of labs are doing this. It's a very natural move with high dimensional data. Um, what is it telling us about the brain? Okay, it could be that neurons are correlated because they're tapping into the same anatomical network, okay? Neurons are just coupled to each other, probably not directly for these 100 neurons, but indirectly um, within M1, and it could be that local architecture that's reducing the dimensionality of the neural activity. It also could be the way M1 is being driven by other areas, parietal cortex, premotor, prefrontal cortex, uh, cerebellum, basal ganglia via the thalamus, these areas may simply be requesting specific low dimensional patterns among the multitude of possible states of M1, okay? So we don't know what gives rise to this low dimensional structure, but we see it all the time. And uh, we can use it to predict whether or not a new BCI is going to be easy to learn how to use or not. The way we do that is by rotating the BCI mapping in a way that either conforms to the low dimensional structure, meaning the solution is among the patterns the animal naturally generates, or uh, exits the low dimensional structure. So now, to move the cursor, the animal has to change the natural correlations among his neurons, okay? The solution is the same. It's still out there in 90 dimensional space, okay? We make sure that they are rotated by the same amount in both cases, and we match things as much as possible, the only difference being whether or not the perturbation of the BCI conforms to the low dimensional structure or not. 
Okay, so this, our prediction is if you respect the patterns of activity that the brain can already exhibit, you are basically doing an adaptation problem and it should be learned quickly. And if you look at the learning curves, they look a lot like adaptation, visual motor adaptation where, you know, reaching to the right moves the cursor up and so forth, okay? Um, these are a more strenuous manipulation because they are in a high dimensional neural space instead of in the low dimensional screen space. But we think it's kind of a step above uh, visual motor adaptation. And correspondingly, they are learned within a single session, sometimes 15 or so minutes, sometimes half an hour. But eventually, by the end of the day, the animal has learned to restore control following one of these within manifold perturbations. And his acquired time goes down, but interestingly, it never gets all the way back to baseline. Black is baseline. This is the intuitive mapping that we designed to be as good as possible. Okay. Uh, the hallmark of learning is the washout period. And when you switch back to the intuitive mapping, the animal exhibits an after effect. He's, he's still kind of stuck in whatever he had learned how to do here. And it takes him a while to get back to baseline even though he was fine with these trials before you introduce the perturbation. Okay. So that resembles the types of learning curves that are all over the behavioral motor learning literature. So this is learning. Okay. In contrast, when we give the animal an outside manifold perturbation, performance is decremented. We choose the amount. We can dial in the amount of the decrement. Too much and the animal gives up. Too little performance hit and the animal has no incentive to learn, okay? So once we hit him with one of these outside manifold perturbations, he cannot find, either his network is unable to find the solution space that would allow him to restore control of this thing, okay? We take away the perturbation and he just picks up where he left off, okay? Does that mean he can never learn that? I'll get to that, yeah. Do you want to, what do you, do you, does this mean he can never learn it? What do people think? Never? These are unlearnable? Think if you give him some time, he learns them? Yeah. Uh, weeks? How about days? Weeks? Months? Yeah. Yeah. We, we had to do it. It's so <laughs> difficult. We only, we did it 15 times for two animals and I got the slides coming up. Okay. They are learned in the course of, um, a few days, but we have to help the animal in order to make that happen. I got some slides on it. Okay. Aaron, I have a question. Yep. So the, well, I mean, you're going to move on. Hunter's question is good, yeah. So this manifold that you're showing here in the illustration is pretty, is, like, if you're orthogonal that plane, you're in big trouble. Yes, right. So in, in 10 dimensions, are there big gaps like that? Like. Yeah. Are, 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 are there big gaps in the, in the space yeah. that yes. aren't covered by the manifold? Yes. Uh, ha -ha. These are, I'm so glad you guys asked these questions. These are exactly the two things that we did next. Okay, so um, uh, let me not give the summary answer because I get to it very soon. Uh, are there gaps in the manifold? Um, this thing is 10 dimensional, but it's not uniform in all 10 dimensions. Um, and we'll get to that. Okay, great. So let me just show um, a movie. Uh, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to show the movie. Do I have time? Half an hour. Okay, so that's intuitive mapping control. Krishna's is better, but you know, it's good enough for us to do the study. Here is early in a perturbation. We choose the amount of difficulty to these perturbations. We can, we can make them orthogonal and the animal doesn't have a chance, okay? Um, and depending on how far we tilt them, we get more of an impairment. And we can predict the open loop performance and give him one that will be difficult, but not too difficult. Okay. With human subjects, you can make it as difficult as you want, which is very interesting because they're highly motivated. Okay. Late in the perturbation for a within manifold uh, perturbation, uh, learning has clearly occurred. He's not as fast as he was, but he's heading pretty much straight toward the target. Late in the perturbation for one of these outside manifold perturbations, and even after a couple of hours, he's stuck. Got that one. Uh, 
the cursor only moves in 2D. Um, you can read out the depth component of his neural activity. Um, he's doing a lot of stuff in the null space of the screen and the null space of the decoder in order to try to get movement in the control space. And it's very fun to look offline to see what happens in task irrelevant dimensions. All right. Uh, so I think you see a clear difference in learning uh, quantified here in two animals, because um, two is the gold standard in primate neurophysiology. Um, <laughs> one is zero, and two is infinite, because we're biologists, so we like to round. Okay. Just, you know, I'm glad it's not three. It work would be even slower if it was three. Yeah, Dustin. What the, okay. um, What happens in that transition phase? I'm, you may be coming to this, but do they just sort of start going random until he narrows in yeah. again, or is there a, yeah. a directed transition between these two um, teams? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. I don't have an answer for that one. Um, uh, Jose Carmina recently published a study in which he suggests that there is um, uh, lots of individual neuron exploration that's then followed by multi-neuron guidance toward the goal. And that is so, so this would be kind of an exploration exploitation model of learning uh, mapped onto patterns of neural activity in M1. Um, that is so fundamentally different from the way we think about things. We think that the animal is more likely to be able to modulate factors of neurons and then over many months change or weeks change in the dial in the activity of individual neurons so there's got to be a process of exploration during that transition period uh, we just have no idea if it's better thought of at the population level or the single neuron level it's going to be fun to try to figure that out yeah parietal or prefrontal premotor? Yeah. Um, uh, we want to do this in premotor cortex, and I would love to do it in parietal cortex. It's, I, I miss parietal cortex. The action potentials are enormous, and the firing rates are very, the action potentials aren't bigger than M1, but the firing rates are much higher in parietal cortex. I think those areas would have, uh, still have a low dimensional structure, but it might be 20 or 30 dimensions. I think part of the reason that M1 is only 10 dimensions is because ultimately what it's doing, at least in this task, is pretty simple. But, you know, PMD has to control M1, so this kind of funnel problem is at a whole different scale. So I think we could identify constraints like this. I just don't know if 100 neurons would be sufficient to find them. I expect more plasticity in PMD and parietal. Yeah. Hello. Oh, the mic. Yes. Sorry. Um, have you looked at the stability of this intrinsic manifold over days? Okay, never mind. I think you're going to answer that. Because <laughs> really what I want to know is that over time, like, do you stay within that hyperplane? Or does it, yeah. or can the monkey itself, you know, create maps which are outside of that hyperplane over, over time? Yes. So that's in, um, hmm. The second question, so we, we look over time, and those are the slides that I put in at uh, 11 last night when I realized you guys would probably care about it. Um, I should have anticipated that. Um, uh, but the, the other question of whether he leaves the hyperplane over time, those are exactly the slides I took out. So maybe we can talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> all right, so uh, you guys get all this already. Um, uh, I th learning is obviously a whole brain process, and it would be awesome to see what's going on in cerebellum and basal ganglia during these two different types of learning. So um, everybody is doing dimensionality reduction on their population data now. Why wouldn't you? Why shouldn't you? And the structure that people are seeing is really subtle and amazing and very, very beautiful. This study, I think, makes a contribution to basic neuroscience because it says all that stuff is real. Because if you ask animals to try to violate the low dimensional structure, they can't do it easily. Okay? So I think that uh, people who say, well, you know, I don't trust this or I don't trust this, these are, if these mean anything to you, great. If they don't, I put some citations up. Low dimensional structure buried in high dimensional data 
is hard for animals to violate rapidly. So maybe it's real. Yeah. A lot. I'm just curious. There's a lot of neurons for a reason, right? Yes. And my my question is: all these tests, I think, or most of them are done in a very similar environment, a very similar sort of structure around this. Watching a cursor screen, sitting in a chair, doing these activities. Is there a chance, or do you think that maybe the low dimensional structure is of that environment, and then maybe if I move to another environment, I can do the same tasks? but it's taking a whole nother context that's not in this constrained way. So is the low dimensionality maybe a con constraint potentially of where you're measuring it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So um, uh, I think it stands to reason that low dimensional structure would be something that is highly contingent on the behavior the animal is doing. Uh, uh, Surya Ganguly at Stanford fundamentally believes that the structure of the neural representation corresponds in some tight way to the structure of the task. And, it's a truism, it, it's a beautiful point, it has to be true. Very simple things like moving the monkey's arm change the particular low dimensional structure that you get because the whole cloud shifts with a postural offset. This is what kind of gets to the, I want to see if I can get her exercise today. <laughs> you know, the corollary then is, and I'm thinking more from a functional use down the road standpoint, you know, is this something where, you know, say I'm sitting here now, I'm trying to do something, I have one low dimensional structure I can train on. Yep. But if I get up and try to walk across the room or doing some other task and I want to do the same thing with my hand, but I'm in a completely different environment, yep. is that manifold completely different? And if yep. that's the case, then how do you train in yep. all these yep. different, yep. Yep. how do we run that? So, uh, you know, analogously, if you do a visual motor rotation straight up, it doesn't transfer to horizontal. So um, how much transfer can we expect as the manifold changes with context? So. Uh, we haven't really stress tested the extent to which the manifold generalizes. We haven't let the animal run around his cage and see if we find the same structure or not. But a few of the things that we've looked at um, indicate that there might be more robustness to the manifold than you might think if you only talk to Surya Ganguly. So um, uh, Andy Jackson used to work with Eb Fetz, did a nice study where he uh, recorded uh, motor cortex activity while monkeys fell asleep in the chair. You know, we all have to deal with that, but for him it became an experiment. And uh, while they were asleep, he could record population activity, do dimensionality reduction on it. That same structure came up later on when the animal woke up and did the task again. So that's not walking around, but going from sleep to wake, the structure was similar enough that one could predict the other. So there will be some dimensions that are hardwired, and there will be other dimensions that are task dependent, and it's important, I think, to separate those. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the questions you guys already asked, how are within manifold perturbations learned? Is there, are there holes, is there substructure to this manifold? And uh, can the outside manifold perturbations be learned eventually? If anybody knows, oh, here it is, good. Okay, um, so uh, Matt's PhD thesis work and Emily's postdoc work. Emily trained with Lee Miller, she's wonderful. Um, okay, so uh, this is the setup you've already seen. We give the animal an intuitive mapping, which means neural activity patterns over here will move the cursor to the right, and neural activity patterns over here will move the cursor to the left, okay? After the perturbation, I told you that that relationship is scrambled. The animal has to generate new patterns of neural activity to get the job done. How does he do it? How does he then cluster his neural activity around the right side of this line, the new line, to move the cursor to the right again? And how does he cluster it to the left, over on this side of the line, to move it to the left? Remember, I'm just showing you a two-dimensional projection of the neural activity, but it's actually a 10-dimensional subspace. Okay. Now is a good time to form your own guesses, because I'll ask what you think. Okay. So one possibility is that the animal simply rotates those two clouds, the cloud of neural activity that moved the cursor to the right, rotates from where it had been to where it needs to be to restore function. Uh, kind of borrowing the nomenclature that Steve Chase introduced in Andy's lab, we call this a realign strategy, okay? Another possibility is that the animal keeps trying to do what he had been doing all along. He just pushes his neural activity further to the right and uh, further in this dimension in neural space, and if you look, that gives you a pretty strong projection 
to the right. The cursor may slow down, but we already know it slows down. Okay, so this is rescale. Just keep trying harder. Okay. Uh, the third possibility is that the animal keeps generating the same patterns of neural activity, but he does them appropriately for the new mapping. So he's got a bag of neural activity patterns that he can draw from, and he selects from that bag, which we call a repertoire, according to what's appropriate for the behavior. Okay? So my first question is, can you guys think of anything else? Is there a fourth possibility that we failed to consider? So you have the intuitive mapping, the perturbed mapping. You need to get neural activity patterns that correspond to this part of the perturbed mapping. How do they get there? We considered realign, rescaling, reassociation, and it may be a failure of imagination that we can't think of any others. Yes, yeah, so this study was, uh, Matt started off by only looking within the manifold, yes. So, um, because that's going to account for 95% of the variance. But um, uh, for OMPs, off manifold is something we have to consider. Yeah. Sort of was to reassociate, but maybe narrowing a little bit. You have a context there that is on both, both scales to some degree. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, right. So, for this illustration, we kept the same scatter points and just colored them differently. And for this one, we kind of tried to just, you know, extend the cloud. So the, the narrowing, um, the narrowing could be a subset of this. Or, you know, the true, these aren't mutually exclusive. I think they're exhaustive, but they're not mutually exclusive. So you could see combinations of them. Okay. Which do you think is going on? Realign? Okay. The first study said you can move around within the intrinsic manifold. New... PCI perturbations that are within the intrinsic manifold are learnable. Keep trying harder, just hope for the best, grit your teeth, or delicately select newly appropriate patterns. Any takers on one? Anyone think this has to be what's going on? Okay. Everyone's like, just tell me already, are you aware it's 9.13? Okay. All of the above. Okay. So it's reassociation with a hint of realign. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's what I, the, the paper, it, it should, I hope, wood, there's wood everywhere. I hope the paper comes out soon. But um, here's what I think is the key figure. You project the neural activity through the BCI decoder. So each of these points corresponds to a neural activity pattern, but I'm only showing you two dimensions of it because that's all I can. And I'm showing you the dimensions of the neural activity that correspond to screen coordinates. So the black points are the neural activity patterns that the animal shows during intuitive mapping control. The red points are the ones he shows during perturbation control after he's learned that within manifold perturbation they superimpose. So um, this slide breaks that cloud up into eight individual target clouds. It's not individual targets, it's eight individual cursor target velocity clouds, but you can think of it as eight targets. So when the animal wants to move the cursor down into the right, he subselects from within the existing repertoire appropriately for that movement, meaning he shows patterns that used to not move it to the right, down and right, and he fails to show patterns that used to move it down and right. Okay. So he's doing a delicate balancing act of selecting from an existing repertoire appropriate for the new mapping. Okay. Uh, this is about an hour, two hours, if the animal keeps working. Yeah. All right, so it seems to me uh, that it would have been easier to simply realign, but it seems like this solution is not available to the animal, at least in the short term of a couple hours. Okay. So we had this idea of this infinite dimensional, ten, di ten dimensional, infinite amplitude, infinite extent, ten dimensional plane. Okay, but that's naive. Neurons have finite firing rates, so there are limits, boundaries to this. We think of it as a cloud, a high-dimensional cloud, rather than a box. Um, but as far as we can tell, we're not finding gaps or substructure within that. It looks like it's kind of Gaussian mound, you know, where most neurons are 
most states are near their average and fall off gradually. But there's definitely structure to it, and that structure is predictive of learning. Okay. Emily's thing. So Emily did the daunting experiment of giving the animal the same outside manifold perturbation for as long as it took, okay? Until either she gave up or the monkey gave up or learning actually happened, okay? So now we're asking the question, are these things unlearnable or are they just learnable gradually? And what we find is performance is quite poor, stays poor throughout the session. The next day he comes back he says, not this again, and he's horrible. He goes home early, comes back on the third day, and uh, maybe he's got a little bit of vigor to him, and he does a little bit better, but learning doesn't show that type of uh, growth curve that we saw for the within manifold perturbations. Okay. Five days, no learning for an outside manifold perturbation. We did this two or three times, said this is too difficult, we have to stop. Is there something else we can do? Are outside manifold perturbations fundamentally unlearnable, or can we actually facilitate learning? So here's what we did to try to facilitate learning. If you can think of a better way, I'd love to know it. This works pretty well, but it may not be ideal. What we do is we start from the intuitive mapping. We choose the outside manifold perturbation we want him to learn, so kind of the goal of his learning process. And then we break it into five bite-sized steps, okay? Just rotating the control plane from the intuitive toward the outside manifold perturbation, trying to give him a crutch or coach him uh, to be able to get his neural activity outside the manifold in the dimensions that will restore function at the task. And, um, oh, you can see how it worked. So here's, I asked Emily to just show one of the eight targets. The animal actually did all eight targets randomly interleaved, but I chose the one that shows the effect I want you to see. So here's the perturbation. Performance is impaired, as you knew. This is uh, after five days, the animal is presented with the full OMP again. For the other four days, he only saw the incremental steps. Two weeks later, he's back in business. So it took two weeks, and we could only get it to work reliably if we coached him there. But they are learnable. Back. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. None. Picks up where he left off for about half of them. The other half show interference. Half of them, he picks up where he left off. OK, so I think of it as like, you know, learning how to skateboard doesn't compromise your ability to learn, you know, your ability to ride a bike prior to that. Okay, so uh, here is the amount of learning exhibited by these 15 <coughs> experiments from two monkeys, okay? Uh, and then uh, the monkeys do have bad days, okay? But if you compare beginning to end, they learn them all. Uh, Emily has chosen six kind of shaded to the side of the distribution. So six that did show learning. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. Um, uh, doing this generates new patterns of neural activity. Showing that has been a difficult thing over the last year for all of us, but I think we have it now. And I actually think it's the, probably the main point of the study, who cares about BCI learning? But this is new patterns of, I do. I hope you guys do, but not everyone does. These are new patterns of neural activity. We demonstrate the animal didn't show these patterns, and then we demonstrate that he does show them 14 days later. So all these tuning curve changes and synaptic plasticity that people report, I think at the end of the day, they result in new patterns of neural activity. Okay. So, um, you know what? I'm gonna jump to something totally different. If you have burning questions about this, ask them. Otherwise, let's chat after the talk isn't gonna move into something else. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we've debated whether, uh, so they, they have a Velcro strap and they quickly, you know, they, they can move, but it's tethered. They learn to stop trying to move. We wonder if we train an animal and allow him to flail while he's doing BCI control, would that facilitate learning? Because he can find some crazy strategy that isn't engaged by the cursor task? Or will it actually inhibit learning because the real movement will 
tether him to his manifold. It's a great experiment, haven't done it yet. Okay, uh, so um, sitting in this purple zone and getting to Baloo's question, um, can we, if you have to go, now is a good time to go because this is something totally different. I won't be offended or anything. Just, okay, uh, you don't even need an excuse. You can just go, it's fine. All right, so uh, let's identify the intuitive mapping, the intrinsic manifold from one day to another, okay? And let's see how stable it is, okay? So lots of people have done studies where you train a decoder on day one and you just lock it in and let the human or the monkey use it until performance degrades. And they talk about how you can make subtle tweaks to try to restore function. We wanted to try to see if finding the intrinsic manifold could speak to that issue. So super quickly, the idea is on day one, you record from a subset of neurons. On day two, you might be recording from a different population of neurons with perhaps some, hopefully some overlap, okay? On day one, you can identify latent space that's an unsupervised thing. It doesn't require the user to consciously participate in a calibration session. On day two, you can identify a potentially different 10-dimensional latent space, all automatically on a short quantity of data. All you do, not all you do, um, takes a lot of uh, computational heavy lifting on Will Bishop's part, but all Alan does once he gives us the algorithm, is align those latent spaces as well as possible. Okay. It involves inverting positive semi-definite matrices. Okay, and then once you've done that, you um, have created a latent space that's aligned as well as possible. So any residual progress that the animal has to make to restore function is totally within the domain of a within manifold perturbation, and in fact, it's even faster than that. So by aligning, identifying spaces on subsequent days, aligning them as well as possible, assigning the same BCI decode to the latent space, restores functionality, and the cursor keeps moving across 15 days without a hitch in performance. So, I think it's cool because it sits in this middle zone where this basic science discovery of low dimensional structure can give us a new approach to this BCI stabilization problem that lots of people are very concerned about. Okay, moving on, just super quick, two more short stories. Um, uh, when I first set up my lab, I thought I was gonna be all the way over here. I was very excited about doing this kind of stuff. So um, we wanted to try to tackle the problem of non-biomimetic feedback for BCIs. So the goal, the dream, would be to microstimulate in somatosensory cortex and recreate the natural experience of moving. That's really hard, and a lot of people are trying hard to do that. So we decided to make the problem simpler and use learning. So the goal was to microstimulate in somatosensory cortex. We're a long way from actually doing this, but the goal is to choose an arbitrary association between parameters of the movement and the microstimulation that you're delivering and let the animal learn those. Keep it, make it arbitrary, but keep it consistent. Let the animal learn it, okay? So um, I first thought we would do this in the context of a center out movement, but Kristen Quick said, my graduate student said, no way. Um, the problem with center out movements is they're too easy, okay? You can learn to make them in a very stereotypical manner. They don't really challenge the sensory motor system the way natural movement does. So she wanted a task that was more difficult and she wanted it to be difficult in a graded way so that you're guaranteed to fail so that you can then compare, well, where did your decode algorithm fail well, that's better than my decode algorithm, and we can actually do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So Kristen saw, we all have curves like this in our paper, showing that brain control does nearly as well as hand control, okay? But, you know, when you actually look at the cursor trajectories, you would not say that's doing as well as the nice, straight, smooth movements that you can make with the hand. So how can we actually establish a, a performance level on BCI systems, and Kristen found this old study from 1966 that does that type of thing in the context of human perception and performance. So it is a pole balancing task, okay? Y'all did this as kids, where if you have a long pole, you can actually conceive of balancing it for a little while, but a pencil will topple right away. So the longer this inverted pendulum is, the easier it is to balance, the more stable it is, okay? 
I mean, it's fundamentally unstable, but it has a more gradual instability as it's longer. Okay, so the 10 subjects, human subjects that she did, and then the two monkey subjects all had to stabilize an unstable system. It's a virtual system by moving uh, their hand in, in three-dimensional space, although only one dimension of the hand movement mattered. Okay, so this is the system that she implemented. Uh, it is far simpler than the physics of pole balancing, which is second and third order. Okay, it's a first order, one-dimensional system where the change in the system's state is proportional to the current system, okay, plus whatever the user is doing with some scaling factor. And the power of the scaling factor is you can make the task more difficult or more easy by increasing the scaling factor. So, the subject's goal is to hold the system still. Perfect control would involve setting the command to equal the system state, but that's impossible because there's a lag um, and it requires a degree of accuracy that's probably beyond what uh, you can achieve. Okay. Task is made more difficult by scaling lambda. So now she has, it's only one dimensional, but it's a, it's a paradigm in which sensory feedback is essential and you're bound to fail as lambda gets higher. So now we can say, well, what lambda did your system fail at and compare that to ours? So what's up top is what the monkey is seeing. It's just a recreation in MATLAB of what the monkey saw. It's the system state at each moment in time. It's not the monkey's cursor position. The cursor position is shown down here and you can see it's basically a noisy lagged offset of the system state. We define successful performance if the animal can maintain the curse, the system state, that blue thing on the screen for six seconds, okay? And then he gets a drop of juice and the next trial starts. As the system gets more difficult, the percent correct falls as you'd expect. And we can identify the 50-50 point and we call that the animal's critical instability value, the maximum system, the most challenging system that the animal can stabilize. Okay. so. Corny illustration, it's like trying to drive three different vehicles and the question is which one can you handle? Okay, so how is this a paradigm for non-biomimetic feedback? We started off with, all we've done so far is tactors on the wrist and uh, elbow that correspond to motor error to the right or to the left. So this is what the animal sees and this is how he's doing at the task. No visual feedback for this trial. So what we want to do now is replace the hand movement with BCI control, replace the tactor with arbitrarily selected electrodes in somatosensory cortex, and make the world's most boring BCI movie where you don't see anything. And then six seconds later, the monkey gets a drop of juice because the whole thing is internally generated and internally fed back. Okay. And then here's some data showing how the animals did. They do better with visual feedback. This animal did better than this animal. They do pretty well with vibrotactile feedback. Um, and one monkey did BCI control and he did okay, okay? But you know BCI control isn't as good as our movement control, but now we can quantify that. Okay, it is uh, 9.30. I'm gonna skip that one last thing. Uh, thank these people. And I just, one quick thing I have to say is um, I have to thank reviewers. We, we have a love-hate relationship with our reviewers. Um, uh, reviewing should not be, I mean, it has to be an adversarial process. There's no other way to do this right. But the service that you guys do when you review is something that has shaped the work that we do. And um, you, know, you don't know if I've reviewed your stuff, but I hope that um, I've been fair and, and helpful and um, I, uh, I appreciate the people who review. I also appreciate the funding agencies and uh, wonderful collaborators I get to work with. Okay, we're out of time, so questions. <laughs> if you have to go, that's fine. It's, I realize it's late already. Thanks. Thanks for the n mentioning the reviewers. Uh, I'm also very thankful for them because without this process, I think science sort of disappears. Um, 
I have one question. This manifold idea, the low dimensional and various manifold, does that sometimes the lack of them, does that tell you anything about the structure of the brain? Yeah. Um, the experiments to get at that are really difficult and we're, we're thinking about the best way to approach it. So does the manifold tell you anything about the structure of the brain? Uh, I think Don proposed the gold standard yesterday, which would be to do this experiment and then do histology and see if you can compare the neurons that were coupled to form the manifold to anatomical connections between them. That may be possible to do in rodents, but we won't be able to in, in monkeys. Um, another possibility would be to record from, uh, to do calcium imaging, which you know, Krishna Shinoy is working toward, where you can hope to image uh, perhaps the filaments that connect neurons and see if that changes as you restructure the manifold through learning. What we could do is try to record from parietal premotor cortex at the same time as motor cortex and see if inputs from those areas are determining certain axes. So I believe there has to be a biological underpinning. It could be anatomical, which is hard to get at. It could be functional, in which case we have a shot at being able to see it. Yeah. Or it could be that the low dimensional structure is because M1 controls muscle synergies and the muscles are highly coordinated. So why shouldn't M1 be highly coordinated? But that would, you know, Darcy Griffith in Peter's lab is able to record EMG and connected neurons in M1. So far, she's only done single neurons. Would love to do that experiment with populations. There has to be a biological underpinning. It's really hard to get at. Svetlana. Uh, this is, this is uh, so um, amazing, actually. So um, I have several questions I have, but uh, let me ask you two. So when, when it's difficult to do something, uh, when you're changing it so dramatically, is it possible that you could help by um, having a network working instead of just one region? Yes, yes. Sure. Um, uh, basal ganglia, cerebellum, heart, you know, perhaps getting at their right. command to M1 or through even cells. other other yeah. cortical sites. Yes, you know, parietal cortex, um, yep. pre premotor, yep. frontal, right. Yep. So we hope that these difficult to learn perturbations might serve as a model for stroke. I, I've been reluctant to stroke our monkeys and study long-term multineuronal learning as a result, but. Maybe by creating a perturbation like this, where we're saying you no longer have what you used to do, now how can you take a population of neurons that used to do something else and repurpose it to do this thing? And yeah. because we're looking at the brain, we can guide you, not just through behavior, but through neurofeedback, guide you to the, a more appropriate neural solution. Right. Yeah. Oh, and one more question. So you're choosing a primary motor cortex, and there might be something very different about it, right? And you yeah. already alluded that you like to work in parietal. Yeah. So is parietal cortex is, from my understanding, is more plastic and more associative and more flexible. Yeah. Would it be easier to learn yeah. in the parietal areas? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it would be. I think, that there, I think that this rule that there's a manifold that's hard to learn out of is probably true. I just would expect, I think we got lucky in a sense that with 100 electrodes we could find a 10 dimensional manifold that was predictive. In parietal cortex you might need 1,000 neurons to identify a 50 dimensional manifold. And we wouldn't be able to do that with this technique. But you know, that speaks to the fact that parietal cortex, arbitrary associations, it flexibly promotes plasticity. Mm -hmm. So the limits may exist, but they may be out of our accessibility. Yep. And what if you could, I mean, imagine someone with stroke, if you could take um, prefrontal parietal cortex and strengthen its projection to the spinal cord, then you can tap into that machinery. Yeah. I have two quick questions. Um, I'm curious about how you showed that uh, you showed how you can shift the uh, off-manifold uh, representation, and the animal would learn that. But then it kind of snaps back to the original manifold. And I'm wondering how that, how you think that correlates with 
the imaging studies that show an expansion of the brain area uh, after a stroke um, because they seem to be, I'm having a little trouble kind of reconciling those two observations. Yeah, I mean, if you could do the experiment where you completely reverse the stroke, I would expect those areas that have been expanded into would snap back to their normal function. I think that would be the prediction, as strong, you know, the specific prediction of this result, but can't do that, so, yeah. It took you a while longer that you could permanently change the manifold? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, the, although we're only doing threshold crossings, they're not stable enough for the type of two or four month experiment that I'd love to do. But I mean, cortex has so many neurons uh, and you know, there's an ex you put the number of neurons in the exponent for the dimensionality that it explores. I think cortex can happily keep all these things without losing any of them. They may get masked or rusty, but they're not gonna get lost, I think, but who knows, yeah. One last question, how do you think what you've shown already can inform how we practice neurorehabilitation yeah, yeah. today. I don't know anything about neurorehabilitation, but my understanding is that some people believe that constrained movement therapy is beneficial, where um, you say, just do it until you can get it to work. And my understanding is that other people have more of a you know, facilitating kind of attitude where you try to take the goal task and simplify it down to achievable components. And I think these results show in terms of neuroplasticity, you want to be able to try to coach toward a goal instead of just leaving the subject, the patient to fend for themselves. So I don't know if that speaks to any relevant issues in neuro rehab, but that's my take on it. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could do the very dangerous thing and talk about how your work talk about the sociological implications of your work. And what, I, and what do I mean by this is that it's sort of related to Dustin's original question that these manifolds, you know, if they are task specific, then maybe they're like certain monkeys may be closer to certain manifolds than others, maybe able to do tasks better than others. And if a task is on a manifold or requires a manifold that the monkey can't, you know, that is orthogonal to its original manifold, maybe the monkey can't learn that task, but maybe another monkey can. Yep. So yep. does that imply that, you know, going to humans, that there may be certain tasks that certain humans, certain people, you know, maybe uh, can't learn, or maybe obviously can learn better than others, but is it because maybe that task may fall on a different manifold than they are used to? So all I can say is, yeah. So, so let, let's take these issues very seriously. I, I went to a conference in Germany and there was a neuroethics component to it and it was one of the most fascinating sessions. And the overall tenor of the conversation was, um, do we anticipate now where neurotech may take us and begin planning for that or do we say, you don't know what's five years away, you don't know what's 50 years away, we'll deal with it when we get there. So uh, just to really repeat what Baloo said and draw this out, um, we have in a very narrow context of you know, a monkey doing a BCI task, we've looked at his brain and predicted what this individual can do and what he will find more difficult to do. Could that possibly extend to predicting who's gonna be better at learning languages, right? Is there something incipient in the network architecture of some people and not others that's gonna predispose some to language, uh, predispose others to uh, classical ballet? And, you know, we can, the, Malcolm Gladwell talks a lot about this Canadian hockey farm league where every boy in Canada starts playing hockey and then some make it and others have to go be doctors or do something less desirable for Canadians. <laughs> so can we do that? Can we, do we want to do that? Is there a chance that the ability to predict from the neural activity is somehow different from the ability to predict from behavior? And um, are there fundamental limits or is it just that some kids are gonna have to work harder at it to get there than others? Do we even want to answer those questions and do they bear any resemblance to what we're doing here? So um, I have no answers. All I can say is these are fascinating questions and um, we should be thinking about them now. Yeah. So you, you're 
data is able to, in the, from the primary motor cortex being projected into 10 dimensional manifolds, kind of that's where it naturally sits. If you were to be able to record from 1,000 cells from that same area, do you think it would still project down into 10 dimensions or is it something, is it going to be higher? Is that kind of a, just a sampling issue as to how many dimensions you're getting? Yep. I, I, I go out on a limb. And I say, if we had denser recordings so that the, you know, the natural motor control was the same, you're just you know, getting slightly different preferred directions or something, that would not accelerate with the number of neurons. It would stay close to 10. If we bring in different body parts, then all bets are off. But I, I think that what M1 is doing is fundamentally 10 to 20 dimensional, not 100 dimensional. could potentially allow you to do higher dimensional tasks right. than would require, that your arm movements require? Yeah. Oh, just super quick. Um, turns out ICMS, if you simply ask a monkey to respond to microstimulation, they're slower than they are for touch on the skin and slower than for vision, which surprised us. Okay, so uh, let's talk about her. What has she got in her brain that I don't have? Maybe she has more dimensions. Maybe she still only has a 10-dimensional, 20-dimensional representation, but she's really good at precisely moving around within it. Um, those are questions that it's very fun to hypothesize about and look at you know, how much neural variability can you actually eliminate if you're collecting over the right population neurons, which is what the spinal cord must do. have a token of our appreciation for you. <laughs> so. Thanks. Thanks.